today I'm in one of the most unique villages in the English Lake District National Park. Its oldest building was erected over 1800 years ago. It's got one shop, two car parks and no through road. There's boats but there's no lake. Oh and it's got a mainline railway station. So where am I? Here's a clue. If you're still not certain, maybe it's time for the big reveal. Today, I'm in Ravenglass. This is the 15 inch gauge Ravenglass and Estelle Railway. It is the busiest of the two railway stations in this small village. The other one is on the Cumbrian Coast route from Lancaster to Carlisle via Barrow. I'm reliably informed that well over a hundred thousand people a year pass through here. In fact, 80% of them never actually leave the railway station. They get off the train, have a look at the engine, have a cup of tea, wander around looking at stuff, and then they get back on the train and head out of town again. I'm not doing that. I'm going to head out of the station and have a look around. Right, uh, apologies for the uh, background noise. There's a diesel. Uh, oh no, he's just turned it off. <laughs> oh, sadly. Right, um, Ravenglass, 2,000 years ago, had a population that's twice what it is today. In fact, more than twice what it is today. Um, a lot of history. It had a harbour, it had a port. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wave goodbye to the railway and go and have a look at all the other attractions that Ravenglass has to offer. The bathhouse and, and also I'm going to try and find a nice hill to climb. So why don't you come with me? First of all, I should point out, I'm not going to be going to Moncaster Castle today. I'm reserving that for another day. You'll notice that I am not on the main road that runs through the village. We'll come to that later. I'm heading for a small viewpoint called Newtown Knot. And on my way, I'm passing by a little bit of history. Now, at first glance, you might be fooled into thinking that this is just a ruin of an old barn on the edge of the field. You couldn't be further from the truth, as this sign is telling us. This building, or what is left of it, is over 1700 years old. Nowadays, it is known locally as Wall's Castle, but when it was built, it was a state-of-the-art Roman bathhouse, complete with underfloor heating. It was considerably larger than the remains suggest. <laughs> Fell down a hole then. Um, which possibly was part of the foundation. Actually, there's a tree stump there, so it was probably an old tree stump. You can see how far away the building is to me, and yet it covered the whole of this area. 
So we, we're talking about something that was much, much bigger. And then, I mean, there's what, another 10 foot to the fence there. So uh, that just goes to show the size of it. It went further over onto what is now the modern road. Um, so a good substantial sized building. It had rooms of varying temperatures, each with their own distinctive purpose. A steam room, a tepidarium, a scalding hot caldarium, and the cold water plunge pool of the frigidarium. It wasn't just somewhere to bathe. Romans saw bathing as a communal event where men, women and children could mingle freely regardless of social class. In its heyday, it would have been a busy place, an important meeting place for the people of the fort and the town that grew up beside it. If these walls could talk, they'd tell of everything from local gossip to big business deals. Sadly, this is all that is left of the Romans' 300-year occupation of this site. The fort and the town that grew up around it stood in the area now covered by this field and woodland. It would have been a good size. 500 soldiers were based at the fort, with a small town of equal size next door. On the seaward side, a good deal of the remains have either been washed away by erosion or destroyed by the Victorian railway engineers of the Whitehaven and Furness Junction Railway, who carved their way through here, destroying anything that was in their path. Right, onwards and upwards, the viewpoint is about half a mile down this road and the weather is clear. I'm told that it's got pretty decent views of the Lake District Fells, so I'm looking forward to it. I would go through this gate and then turn left up that slope there. There's no signpost and the track is steep and rutted. Now, this is a first for me. I've walked through cow fields and sheep fields, and past fields with llamas in, but this is the first time I've ever walked through a field and been spied on by turkeys. I should be fine, as long as I don't mention Christmas. This hill is not high. It's not too steep once you climb the first bit. But the views are really quite impressive. What appears to be a partially ruined building is actually a beacon tower. Now, if you come here, do bear in mind that although this is open access land, it is also part of the Moncaster Castle estate. There are no footpaths over the hill. The only way down is the way we came up. It is possible to do a loop so I could go round to the coast and then back along the seashore. But there's two things. I don't want to disturb the sheep at lambing time. Uh, and also, 
I didn't check the tide tables before I set off on this. So I don't want to get there and then get cut off by the tide. So I'm backtracking a bit here. I'm heading back past the bathhouse. A couple of a hundred yards after the bathhouse, turning and left, going under this railway bridge and up to the beach. This is actually the estuary of the River Esk as it reaches the sea after its short journey down the Esk Valley. It's joined here by the River Urt, which drains Waswater just a few miles to the north. And the river might. When the Romans came, they set up their port on the tidal reaches of the River Esk. It was nicely protected from the ravages of the Irish Sea, as well as any attack from the pirates that raided this coast. Some historians believe that St Patrick was born in Ravenglass, around about the time that the Romans left the area, and that he was captured by pirates and taken to Ireland as a slave when he was 16 years old. However, other historians have cast doubt on this idea, and the exact whereabouts of his birthplace are not known. Regardless of the fate of St Patrick, the port survived both the Romans leaving and the pirate raids. In fact, the last cargo boat sailed in just over a hundred years ago. The main street of the modern day village ends here, at a large floodgate leading onto the sands. Actually, I say modern day, but many of the houses here date back to well before the railway was built. In fact, as this plaque reveals, there was a Saturday market here back in the 13th century. Note that the houses all face into the street and not out onto the sands. That's an indication of the importance of the market and the village's position as a trading centre. Walking down the street, it's clear that the local residents care very much about their village and the surrounding area. Nowadays, it is a haven for tourists, although few ever seem to venture very far away from the station. That's perhaps not too much of a bad thing. It helps the village retain its old world charm instead of being overrun with gift shops and ice cream parlours. The old petrol pump has caught my eye. Back in 1970, I remember my father filling our holiday minibus with petrol here. The pump was hand-cranked and delivered petrol at about six shillings a gallon. That's the equivalent of 30p for four and a half litres. I thoroughly enjoyed that little wander around. And then, I hope you enjoyed it too. Uh, there's only one thing for me to do, and that's visit the Ice Cream Emporium. Get myself a nice ice cream. And then, I hope you've enjoyed that. If you did, subscribe to the channel. Until next time, stay safe and happy wandering. <laughs>